The Habakkuk project arose out of a problem that the British, and the other allies to be fair, faced in the early part of the Second World War. U-boats were of course causing problems by sinking merchant ships, even those in convoys, and even with America's entry into World War II, there was the so-called Mid-Atlantic Gap. Here, U-boats could operate with great effectiveness as they were out of range of land-based aircraft from either side of the Atlantic. Air cover in the Mid-Atlantic would drastically curtail the effectiveness of these submarines, but there were a few problems with implementing this. Fleet carriers were in short supply, and would in any case be a prime target. They also could not recover and launch larger twin or four-engine patrol craft, which would be the most efficient way to cover large areas of ocean. And even a fleet carrier's hull carried relatively few operational supplies compared to the fuel needs of running dozens of patrol flights every day for weeks or months on end. There was a separate issue of covering seaborne landings, as a carrier approaching to a range where it could support such a landing was also putting itself in range of land-based aircraft, which tended to not go so well unless you had utterly overwhelming force. Due to the relatively small air group of even the largest American carrier, compared to the number of aircraft available on normal airfields for the kind of amphibious operations the Allies were anticipating against Germany or Italy. Enter Geoffrey Pike, a classic British inventor in that his ideas wandered back and forth over the razor's edge that divides utter genius from complete insanity all the time. In this case, he'd realised that in terms of energy costs, ice was much cheaper to make than steel. Therefore, clearly, a giant ice island could be made and used to provide a safe airport at sea. Handily, as the Titanic had discovered a few decades earlier, large chunks of ice were also freely available in the Atlantic. But this ran into something of a problem when it was pointed out to him that Ice wasn't actually as strong as it first appeared, especially if you were dealing with the weight of multiple aircraft. It had this annoying tendency to melt in sunlight, and icebergs that were subject to this melting had a most disagreeable habit of rolling over almost at random. Luckily, at this point, Pike gathered a small group of equally unstable geniuses around him, and between them they came up with the idea of Pikerite which was water mixed with about 14% wood pulp, Canadian spruce, for some reason, being the best form of wood pulp tested. Once frozen and kept at an appropriately low temperature, it showed little to no movement after an initial settling period, and even above freezing, it took weeks to begin melting, with larger masses being more and more resilient. Again, in a rather British fashion, the experiments to derive the best formula for Pikecrete took place not in a highly secret uh, high-tech facility, but rather in a basement meat locker of Smithfield's Meat Market in London, where ice, cold temperatures and wood shavings were all plentiful, with the primary security being a screen of frozen pigs on hooks which they used to hide behind. The resulting material proved to be as strong, or stronger, than concrete, its resilience being proved according to some accounts by Lord Mountbatten placing a block of ice on a table in the middle of a conference between Churchill and Roosevelt, along with many other high-ranking officials, and then blowing it apart from a shot with his service revolver, security at high-level meetings being somewhat different back then. He then shot at a block of pikerite, which was mostly untroubled, and the bullet ricocheted off, poking a hole in the trouser leg of the legendarily anglophobic Admiral King, which I feel can't have helped to improve his opinion of the British. Thus convinced, the project was given the go-ahead to produce a smaller 1,000-ton, 60-foot-long test ship in Canada. This proved highly successful, being kept frozen by a grand, mighty one-horsepower motor, and eventually taking two years to melt and sink after the motor was switched off and the ship was left to degrade. The project also picked up the name Habakkuk, taken from a verse in the Bible which reads, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvellously, for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told to you. 
And I'm pretty sure that any U-boat captain, Luftwaffe pilot, or Wehrmacht commander who came across this thing probably wouldn't have believed it, especially if it was only being told to them. For the plan called for 300,000 tonnes of wood pulp, 25,000 tonnes of insulation, 35,000 tonnes of timber, and over 10,000 tonnes of steel, plus, of course, vast quantities of water, that would produce a ship with a hull 40 feet thick, a rudder over 100 feet tall, a total displacement of 2.2 million tonnes, a flight deck 2,000 feet long, which for some scale is as long as two modern nuclear supercarriers stuck end to end, with an armament of 80 4.5 inch, inch dual purpose guns in twin turrets, and innumerable smaller 20 and 40 millimeter cannon, an air group in excess of 200 aircraft, including entire squadrons of heavy bombers, shells, bombs, and torpedoes could blow huge chunks out of it but never breach its monolithic structure, and with a number of cargo storage areas dedicated to carrying more wood pulp, the rest of the needed repair materials would be freely available all around them. This was a considerable vessel by any regards. It would not be the fastest vessel in the world, nor would it be the most manoeuvrable, but to be honest, for a vessel whose primary design purpose was to sit in the middle of the Atlantic and launch vast streams of aircraft in all directions, this was not really much of a concern. However, unfortunately for all of us, it was not to be. Further work with the test ship showed that the amount of steel needed would be similar to that needed for a full fleet carrier. That in and of itself was not a problem, given the much greater capacity of the Pikerit Leviathan. But the USA was also beginning to crank out numerous escort carriers, aircraft with longer ranges were being deployed, and an agreement with Portugal to use the Azores as an airbase had been signed. This largely negated most of the issues that had led to the need for the Habakkuk project in the first place, and so the project was sadly cancelled, and we were denied a gigantic floating ice island for all eternity. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.